Well, I, I've i actually been involved with HIV work since the very early days. First I heard of it was when it was called GRID, Gay-Related Immune Deficiency, which of course then spawned the thing of it being the gay plague, um, and then HTLV3 and then HIV. Um, I was involved in the early stages of setting up voluntary services in those days, originally in the Birmingham area, later in Nottinghamshire, London, um, and then coming back to Birmingham, and a, a short time as well working in the United States. Um, during those early days, I also met and uh, supported the first haemophiliacs that I'd ever met with HIV, as predominantly our caseload at that time had always been gay men. Those early days, we have to remember there was no treatment, uh, there were no real services, we faced uh, prejudice and discrimination within um, the services offered by local authorities and also within hospitals where certain staff would refuse to feed people, to go into rooms, they would put barriers up um, before you went in. Um, so it was, uh, it was a very different time where we were making things up as we went along. We were developing support and services and knowledge. The thing that I remember the most about those days was the huge uncertainty and the difficulty quite often in the medical profession to deal with that uncertainty. Uh, we, I always took the approach, because we really didn't understand what it meant to be HIV positive, what it meant to have your diagnosis, um, that we should say that, that we didn't know, but some medics and some uh, individuals took the approach of telling people that they believed that they had a lifespan of between two and five years at the, at the maximum. And I think that that itself still to this day haunts um, the community of long-term survivors and especially the haemophiliac community of the, those young people and families who were given that information at that time. I, I think it's easy now to look back in hindsight and to say that people were angry, well, what's it? At that time, we didn't have really time at the beginning to have real feelings of anger to start with because it was the matter of fact that people were dying, dying quite horrifically, quite quickly, and we were actually just dealing with that. It was more as we started to develop antiretroviral treatments, etc., that we actually started to look and that it was very aware, people were very aware that haemophiliacs had known for a long time the dangers of the product that they were being given and that they were using and that nobody had heeded those dangers and that the anger of that nobody at that be at the beginning took responsibility and I truly feel that back then if somebody in government or somebody from the Department of Health had stood up and apologised we wouldn't be where we are today. The question is quite complex in that we have to split it in two. One between the psychological needs and support of the individual and their families and to the actual physiological needs and support of the individual and their families. So first, if we look at the psychological, that the impact of having a life-threatening diagnosis from early on in your age and being told by doctors and by the medics who you have relied on all your life that your life expectancy could be between two and five years and living beyond that, is, is, is a very difficult thing for people to get their head around, to understand, to process it. And also because a lot of people saw 
their cousins, their brothers, their uncles die, that also projected to them what their future would hold, that this is where I will be. And even when antiretrovirals came in and people were able, we were able to stabilize people's health, that there was still this fear of this is where I'm going to go. This is where my life is going to take me. So it didn't matter that these things were there. It was this actual sort of fear of life now. On the physical side, there was, it was usually, it was the complexity of people who, before antiretrovirals, actually became unwell, had opportunistic infections, managing those opportunistic infections, and supporting people um, to, to have independent lives at home and within their communities. The other part of that was, was that also haemophiliacs were aging, their joints issues, their arthropathies, um, their bleeding patterns, which were interfered with by the antiretrovirals, etc. All these things made very complex things. The main issues that we still face today are housing issues, moving into accommodation um, that uh, is more appropriate to their needs. Um, benefit issues uh, is, is probably the biggest that we do, is actually helping people with their ESA, their PIP, um, applications or reapplications. Um, we also aids and adaptations to properties um, and then uh, a lot of sort of psychological support as well um, which has become far more difficult because as um, recently with the changes in budgets within hospitals and uh, budgets going to GPs a lot of the uh, budgets that we had that we could actually offer a more comprehensive psychological support has, has sadly uh, disappeared uh, to where now um, I will assess somebody and if I think it needs more that we will actually refer them on to their GP. Um, so it, 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 it's a multitude of, of, of needs and some, some people's needs are mental health needs, some are, as I said, are to do with welfare, rights, benefits, etc., housing benefits, um, supporting people in work as well. Um, talking to employers about people with haemophilia and uh, co-infections as well. So it, we, we, we sort of, it, it, it's, a, it's a complete picture really um, of, of helping people from um, their housing issues all the way to employment issues, to helping them around issues of looking at uh, relationship issues, uh, around fertility issues. Uh, really, it, it is no different to the greater, wider community, but it has one complexity flowing through it, that these are people with haemophilia, these are people who are co-infected, etc. And it makes for a far more complex and difficult journey than people who are in the community and don't have these added um, comorbidities. No, not at all. Uh, sadly, I think that that is um, a bit of almost propaganda that is put out there to make everybody feel good about the situation. I, the reality for for all of the haemophiliacs is that they are the front line. They are the complete front line. Some of the guys who are around now uh, and some of the um, infected partners, they've lived with this virus since we understood what this virus was. There is nobody in front of them. We can't say to anybody out there, look, don't worry, in 10 years down the line there's this or there's that. We really don't know what tomorrow will bring. Yes, it is manageable to a degree and most people are stabilized. Um, they have good CD4 counts now, they have undetectable viral loads, but it's actually throwing up other um, 
other medical issues now. It is is it is creating you know issues around bone density, cardiovascular problems, uh, premature aging. It is uh, called uh, hyperlipidemia, and uh, lots of other issues are coming up, and we don't really know what tomorrow will bring. So there is this. If we are being honest, we don't know. And I think that that is the, the reality of where we are. I, I think that the, the, the main difficulties are, are twofold. One is, as I said previously, it's the uncertainty of what tomorrow will bring. Um, that all the guys are very aware of where they're at. They're also aware that they can't look down the line and see somebody else and say, oh, well, look, you know, they've done 10 years more than me. That gives a sense of insecurity for the future. The second part of that, which breeds even greater insecurity, is the whole issue of some settlement, final settlement from the government around the issue of support of replacing the McFarlane Trust or looking at um, the Penrose uh, and the settlement in Scotland, etc. At least in Scotland now, whatever people think, they know what the settlement is, they know where they're going, and they can plan their lives. The people in the rest of the UK don't have that. They don't know. If we could bring that end, if we could actually bring an end to that, that, that insecurity, that uncertainty in people's lives, I think that it would allow people to move on because most individuals out there you can have your life insurance you can have your things in place that you can protect your families your children's futures etc this is still denied to all co-infected guys if the government can find to to bring resolution to that and and, and to seriously look at how we have got to the position where one part of the United Kingdom is going to settle and the rest of it is actually still going to be left with that future of uncertainty. I, I think it, it is wide ranging. And, and I think one of the things that I will always remember um, to my dying day is when we were, I was working with one of the mothers whose son had sadly died um, and we were going through his medical records and actually uh, looking at the batches, the contaminated batches that he had received. And when we actually identified that he was actually contaminated with a batch that was given as home treatment she was devastated because she realized the only person who had ever given him home treatment was herself so that it was her who had actually given him and infected him with HIV and hepatitis C on that day she died because she stopped living she's physically alive but the devastation that that had on her that impacted on her was great and, and there are such stories to be told about partners as well, partners who went through that situation with their um, husbands, with their loved ones, um, and were unable to do anything to help them. And that feeling of frustration and of of, of desperation that nobody was there to help them during that time still haunts a lot of the partners etc and the fact that they had they felt it doesn't matter what the reality is they constantly felt that they had to battle for everything they they were constantly left feeling that nobody was listening to them and it did spawn a sentiment amongst people that maybe people just want us to die 
and disappear and the problem will go. Uh, no, I can't believe that anybody actually ever thought that that was their policy, their belief, and that, that the problem would go. But it, there is something of an indictment upon our society that people were actually left feeling that way. And that goes across the board to grandparents who are left looking after grandchildren and because both of their their, their, their sons and their daughter-in-laws have died it goes across to wives it goes across to same-sex couples it goes right across the board and I think that until we recognize that pain until we actually realize that we need to bring resolution to that that we will constantly open these sores up for these people every day of their lives no in in, in reality it was always a sticking plaster it was you always got the feeling that they felt that this was going to be a short-term issue that they would deal with and in you know next five to ten years it would all be finished with completely and of course the reality was was that actually people's health stabilized people continued so it was always the feeling that the response from the government especially within their funding and setting up of the McFarlane Trust, the setting up of the Skipton Fund, the setting up of Caxton, the setting up of the Eileen Trust, all these organisations, which, you know, we have to remember all fall under the same roof. It is not as if they are sort of spread across the country and don't know each other. They are almost one organisation that they were constantly playing catch-up with the needs of the primary beneficiaries and their families. Though the McFarlane Trust has had many criticisms put against it, in those early days, right up until recent years, when a beneficiary of the McFarlane Trust um, became... Um, unwell we could actually contact the mft and request that they give um support in the short term while long-term care packages could be put in place for people who were in, in in the end stages of their life that would could be put in place within hours sadly that isn't true today uh, we've had cases recently where we have had somebody in the final stages and they have applied to one of the trusts for support and they were told that they needed to do an expenditure form first and sadly the person died before they could even fill in such a form the the issue with all of these for a lot of primary beneficiaries has been the fact that they have felt that they have to jump through hoops to get it. And we've been promised by Archer that there would be no more feeling like you're going cap in hand, that there would be no more jumping through hoops to get um, the services, the support that you require. When I saw the proposal for the first time, I couldn't believe that they had actually listened or spoken with any of the infected community. It was just one of the most crass and ill-thought-out documents that I had ever read. Um, my understanding from the majority of people that I've spoken to who answered and sent back um, the proposal was that they all felt the same. I don't think that they realise that it just never allows time for people to heal. That every time that something comes along, Archer came along and everybody thought that now this would bring resolution. 
Penrose came along, and though there was a lot of people upset about Penrose, more so than Archer, it was still felt when the recommendations were put out there that this would bring resolution. And sadly it hasn't, because what the government doesn't realise in all of these consultations, all of these processes, it just constantly rips the sores open again and rubs salt into them because there is no resolution to what people are asking. And yes, I know it's very easy to say, well, you know, an apology has been given in Parliament, but actually the promises that were made have not been followed up. So that, again, is this salt being rubbed into the into the wound. And yes, it, it's very easy to say, well, you know, it can't be just about, you know, a monetary solution. Well, actually, yes, it can be, because a lot of people have had their lives taken from them. A lot of people aren't here. We're now talking below 300 people out of the 1,200 left alive. So the, the need to actually give people stability for the future, to actually, yes, to actually put figures to it and say, look, you will be okay. It doesn't matter if you become unwell. It doesn't matter. This is the protection and the support that we will give to you and your families for the future. I, yes, you, you get frustrated by constantly seeing cuts and constantly seeing what you know could be done, not being able to be delivered um, because of the, the, the lack of services and support that's out there. Do, do I actually become overwhelmed by it? I, I, I would find it somewhat... I would find it somewhat remiss of myself if I became overwhelmed because I think that all the people who I support and I work with and hopefully try to empower and enable in their lives, they have greater things than the frustrations of the welfare state and the frustrations of local government to deal with. And so it's actually their energy that I can actually pick up on and carry on. And we try constantly of finding new ways to offer the support that people are looking for.